Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to IS4, the Indonesian Social Science Seminar Series. This virtual series brings together experts of Indonesia from all around the world to discuss pressing issues facing the country. So IS4 is sponsored by the Sydney Southeast Asia Center, the Cornell Southeast Asia Program, and the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. Um, so I'm Jessica Sidirigo, and I will be chairing this talk. Um, on a personal note, it's good to be back after the August break, and we have an exciting lineup for the fall edition of this series. Um, to, so today I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Hank Schulte Nordholt. Um, he's an emeritus pro professor of Indonesian history and honorary fellow at Kaitel V in Leiden. Um, our discussant is Dr. Bambang Kurwanto, who is a professor in history at Universitas Gajah Mada. Um, the format uh, of this talk will be a little different uh, compared to our prior talks. Uh, both Dr. Nohut and Dr. Perwanto will be commenting on Indonesia historiography, periodization from Indonesian and Dutch perspectives, and the ways that these divergent trajectories uh, speak to and past each other. And um, we've, just, we've decided that we'd like the session to be a little bit more conversational uh, rather than a lecture. And so we'd really like to hear what the audience is thinking. So after our speaker and discussant comment, if any of the audience, anyone in the audience would like to speak and contribute to the discussion and conversation, um, please type your comments in the Q&A box and then I'll look through those written comments and then select some of the participants um, to speak on those comments briefly. Um, comments can either be in Bahasa Indonesia or English. Um, unfortunately, because of the size of the audience and our limited time, we won't be able to get to everyone, but we'll do our best to get um, as many people to contribute to the conversation as we can. And so with that, I will pass uh, the mic to Pahink. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um... Good morning, Amsterdam. Uh, Selamat siang, Jogja. Good afternoon, Sydney. And since it is still three o'clock at night in Ithaca, we will just let them sleep. They will uh, join us later uh, when they go back to the Facebook page. Um, today, it's an auspicious day, 30th September, um, in Indonesian history, and as well as in Indonesian historiography, um, <clears throat> for short, both are still haunted by the military, um, the Indonesian military. I will come back to that at the end of my, my talk. Um, the purpose is actually to investigate the nature and the impact of historical periodization um, <clears throat> in Dutch and Indonesian history writing and the consequences it has and questions that uh, questions include um, is there actually a shared Indonesian Dutch historiography now the sneak preview on this question is uh, uh, for short uh, no um, or hardly there are very different uh, trajectories um, of Indonesian and uh, Dutch historiography which have very much to do with, with colonial um, obsessions. And the following question is, where is, um, also to say briefly, where's the post-colonial in Indonesia and the Netherlands? And the, the short answer to that is, it's very hard to find actually. And I may <clears throat> suggest some reasons for that. So, the bad habits of periodization in historiography is that it leads to compartmentalization, locking various episodes up in closed boxes, which are seemingly unrelated. Um, now, the purpose of this meeting is, and I hope also with the help of my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Bambang Puwanto, to ask questions in order to open up this compartmentalization and um, 
we are totally at the mercy of Jessica, uh, and I hope that she will be able to uh, include as many uh, comments by the audience as well. So let me start. What do Dutch Indonesian historiographies actually share? Um, and I, I mean mainstream Indonesian historiographies. There are always, of course, very, very interesting <clears throat> and, and, and uh, inspiring examples. The answer is very, very little. You may say Dutch history in Indonesia and also historiography in Indonesia stops simply in 1950, when the revolution was over, when the colony was lost. And there is an enormous emphasis on colonial, colonial histories before 1940, and which emphasizes white agency. It is uh, very much the story of what white and Indo-European families did and achieved uh, uh, in, in Indonesia. And it has, of course, to do with, with, with archives. The, the archives in the Netherlands are in Dutch and represent very much a, a Dutch perspective and leave very little agency to Indonesians. Now, that picture changes totally after 1950. Um, the colony is replaced by am amnesia and nostalgia. These are the two key words. It is, uh, forget about it, it it's gone. Uh, we should look forward. Uh, social sciences oriented itself uh, towards Africa. That was the new future. And there was an immense nostalgia, uh, uh, a sense of loss, the good old colony, the, 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 uh, the privileged positions of all these people who had to leave the colony and came in a kind of cold and chilly Netherlands where they were not well received. And you get migration histories uh, of groups that were basically tied to the colonial state, uh, Indo-Europeans, Chinese elite families, Peranakan Chinese, and a group of Moluccan soldiers. Uh, and these are stories filled with loss. And there was very little interest in independent Indonesia. If in the Netherlands you publish a book on, say, um, uh, Indo-European families in the, in the colony, it will sell. If you publish a book in the Netherlands on modern developments in Indonesia, it will hardly sell. People are simply not that interested. Now, on the other side, Indonesian history starts basically mainstream, correct me if I'm wrong, in 1945. Then the whole story of the Indonesian nation starts. And it seems as if pre-1945, pre-42 perhaps, is another country uh, that was left. That was the country that was dominated. That was colonialism. And <clears throat> colonialism was gone. So that whole era seems to be gone. Uh, it became somehow irrelevant, except for the story of um, the national movement. So there's very little interest in the kind of legacies of the colonial state in independent, for in the independent Indonesian nation state. Um, very little interest in the fact that people who lived in the 1930s lived through the 1940s and also arrived uh, in the 1950s and brought with them all their experiences and the things they have learned in the colonial period. What happened to them? That is a question that is hardly asked. Compartmentalization. Whoops, where am I? Yeah. <clears throat> so the only overlap uh, it seems that the Dutch and Indonesians really have is the period of 45-50. But here we see two very, very opposite uh, approaches. For the Dutch, it was a period of decolonization that failed, failed decolonization. But for the Indonesians, it was liberation, it was victory. So very different sort of uh, stories that hardly touch each other. There are hardly any shared concerns and it's more collision than connection. For the Dutch books, most mainstream books, and that is now changing very much, I should admit, mainstream books were about decolonization. That means that the Dutch uh, 
were the main actors to guide Indonesia to independence. Because Indonesia was not really capable of doing that, of course. And that failed because these, these impatient Indonesians were not willing to listen to the Dutch. So that is full of colonial uh, assumptions. And for Dutch historians, they emphasize diplomacy. That is where real politics take place. And that the, the, the diplomacy was basically disturbed by warfare, by these guerrillas who couldn't understand that the real level of politics would be in the field of diplomacy. So an interesting experience my, I myself had uh, was, was already 25 years ago in a panel discussion, which I joined in 1995, where the then chairman of that um, session uh, really asked the question about uh, the period of, of, of on, on, on the Indonesian revolution, what went wrong? Um, so I answered, well, nothing much went wrong because Indonesia uh, became independent. Indonesia won the war. And then there was an awkward silence for a while because that's, it, it typifies the kind of uh, <clears throat> perspective uh, colliding perspectives. So the Dutch denied for a very long time to Blas Augustus as the starting point of Indonesia and stick to 27 December 49, the formal uh, handing over of sovereignty, the, the recognition of, of, of the, the final recognition of, of independence. And Dutch history writing totally silences uh, violence. Now, for the Indonesian side, there's a very different perspective. Revolution is seen as the finalization of an inevitable linear trajectory towards national uh, liberation. Uh, that, 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 is, that is a very uh, linear sort of uh, logic in it. So it's a story of liberation and victory, of course which downplays in the official version, in the state version, internal conflicts, crises, civil war, etc. And it needs to emphasize the rise of the Republic as a unitary state. Interestingly here, it also silences violence. Um, it highlights some of the, of the, the Dutch cruelty but it silences the fact that probably 150,000 Indonesians died, were victims of the revolution. So there is from the official point of view, uh, a denial of victims because it, there is a celebration of victory and there is no place for victims in this story except for the glorification of heroes. Pahlawan Nacional are everywhere. But interestingly, I should add, there is another side to it that at the local level in Indonesia, but you have to look for it. There are all kinds of small graveyards of real victims. So there are, there are local activities of commemorating victims. And maybe if I may give an advice, that, that could be a very, very interesting topic for an MA thesis, perhaps for an ambitious uh, Indonesian student for a PhD. Think about it. That, that, that is interesting. And of course, the, the one more point on the, the inevitability of, of national liberation. The point is writing about revolution is so difficult because we all know how it ended. But for all the participants who, who witnessed the start of the revolution, really nobody had any idea where that would end. The main concern for Sukarno was that he would be arrested the next day by the Japanese. <clears throat> and we tend to forget that, those anxieties, <clears throat> once we realize who won. So the perspective of the winner dominates, distorts a view of the historical process. Now, where in this um, compartmentalized uh, sort of approach of history is the post-colonial? My first witness in this case is um, Professor Ariel Herianto, two years ago uh, <clears throat> at an, um, a seminar in Leiden, he made the statement that post-colonial studies actually hardly exist in Indonesia. It, it is basically, maybe it exists, but it's hardly visible. I hope he's wrong, but I'm afraid he's right. Um, the point is, I think, uh, 
the post-colonial approach needs a former colony. But if that former colony is closed and put away as a sort of closed box and it has no connections with the next period, it's very difficult to relate to that past. Apart, as I said, from the nationalist movement, there is not much interest among historians <clears throat> with one major exception, and he's joining, fortunately, this, this session, uh, that's Professor Bamba. There's not much interest in the nature of, colon of the colonial state and how that impacts what follows. For instance, the Indonesians, there are so many, eight, eight, say 70 to 75% of all the personnel of the colonial state was Indonesian. So there was a huge participation, Indonesian participation in that colonial state. And all these people entered the 1950s, entered in a new um, period of, of, of independence, but what did they take with them? And don't forget the dynamics of indirect rule that large parts of Indonesia were basically practically ruled by a local Indonesian nobility under um, uh, Dutch supervision. So what happened to the legacies of that state? <clears throat> now, meanwhile, in the Netherlands, interestingly, there were, there, for a long time, not much of post-colonial studies either. But there were, but not on Indonesia. And I think what, what counts here is the absence of uh, a critical mass of colonial migrants, colonial, say, descendants of colonial migrants, uh, intellectuals who reflect on their position, and who start to think in terms of, of post-colonial uh, uh, relationships <clears throat> and tensions. The migrants that came, who came from Indonesia were tied to the colonial state, Indo-Europeans, Chinese. <clears throat> so they, there's now uh, a, a recently, uh, uh, under say the third, maybe the fourth generation of migrants, um, people start to think uh, rethink their position. And the post-colonial basically entered from the West, from migrants in the Netherlands who came from the Antilles in Suriname. And here slavery uh, became, a, 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 and racial violence and racism became a dominant theme. So violence <clears throat> became a theme and that stimulated a new discussion in the Netherlands on colonial violence in Indonesia. And it's now in particular focused on, on the revolution, uh, partly because there is now a big research project in the Netherlands on Dutch military violence in Indonesia. And it is about to, to end now and the results will soon be published. But that results in the fact that for activists, colonialism is basically violence. Uh, that, that is the, the shortcut. Um, on the theme of violence, of violence is interestingly, there is not really um, a lot of response in Indonesia. Violent, colonial violence does not seem somehow to become an important theme because uh, as people told me in Indonesia, well, well, why bother? We won, we won that war, it's over. And um, uh, of course there are victims, but that is not a matter of uh, great concern. There's another thing. Um, there's now a new <clears throat> search for identity, a third, fourth generation of Indo-Europeans. They, they try to look for their uh, grand uh, mothers. So that is the Indonesian line in their, in their genealogies are explored. And that, that is very interesting because they are faced, they always, they grew up in the Netherlands with the sense that they were European. And now they are faced in public with uh, racism they are seen as blacks. And that is of course a shock and they have to deal with that. Now, um, <clears throat> as for um, some connections, um, I, I'll brief mention them very briefly, uh, what I already mentioned. One important theme is how to connect the colonial past with the Indonesian nation state. And some suggestions, I think, Middle classes and modernity are important. Um, the middle class in Indonesia in, in the colonial period was basically denied access to politics, but very much invited to join a um, colonial culture and to become cultural citizens of the colonial state. 
and in that respect, in, in by participating, they became a sort of they, they supported, they sustained the colonial regime. Um, and how did they? What was their encounter with um, the independent Indonesian nation state? That is still open. That is an open question. Um, related to that are legacies of colonial knowledge systems. They were also taken, uh, trans, trans, uh, uh, planted into a new nation state. Uh, an academic elite um, took over universities and started an educational Indonesian educational system. How did that work? Uh, Remco Raben is, is uh, leading a very, very interesting research project uh, on, on this topic. So I'm very curious to know more about uh, the outcomes of that, of that research. Now, there are more things to, to, uh, to explore. Say, attitudes of the state uh, on ethnicity, uh, on development, on education, on economic systems of exploitation. There are what kind of continuities changes are taking place there. And um, what about <clears throat> a very important issue is the legacies of the left. Um, uh, if you follow uh, the Indonesian revolution, you see also that it is the big defeat of the leftist movement. It was um, in two steps. It was uh, finished in 48 in a so-called Madiun uh, uh, revolt, and then finally in 1965. But I think that that leftist tradition was important, and um, it is still it, it, a taboo, but it it, it deserves uh, a kind of well critical and uh, new research. Then finally, to come back to um, uh, 19, uh, 30 September, it is impossible to ignore the military talking about uh, Indonesian historiography. Um, there are a lot of military continuities between the 1940s and now. Um, and to a large extent, the military tried to monopolize um, the historiography of the revolution and by that to monopolize the revolution because their role in the end of the war uh, was important in 1949. But um, for them, it's the legitimation to behave as ultimate guardians of national unity and to act if necessary. Um, they give themselves this, this, this privilege and it's, 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 that has never left the discourse, I'm afraid. So in that respect, the Indonesian military are not amused at all by the Dutch project on military violence in the revolution. And from all, uh, all our efforts to uh, <clears throat> get access to military sources or to establish cooperation, there was this rejection, basically saying, get out of my revolution. This is my revolution, and I don't want outsiders to, to meddle into that. Um, so that poses the question, and that is a question that has already been asked in Indonesia, and that is a an, an, an very awkward and, 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 and sensitive, and, but still very, very critical question. Who, own, who actually owns the revolution? Uh, it was also very much a popular revolution. So where is society in this discourse? Um, another point is if you look at the, the kind of relationships between the military and I meant to write here vigilantes, not vigilates, uh, vigilantes. Um, that starts in the late Japanese period and it goes through uh, the, the uh, Indonesian revolution. The, the the relationship with the with the formal uh, between the formal uh, military and all these Lashkar and Badan Perjuangan etc cetera, etc cetera, that also uh, created a very violent legacy for post colonial Indonesia which is hardly discussed and that is part and parcel of the story of the military in Indonesian history and then um, 
finally, and I have to admit myself uh, that I was unable to, to trace uh, anything uh, substantial about that. Where are the women's voices in the history of the revolution except for the few heroes? Uh, it is basically women uh, who kept the households going in very difficult circumstances while all the men were somewhere else, either working under the Japanese as Romusha or fighting the revolution. So that is uh, very worthwhile to uh, explore also. I, I'm running out of time. I had one more slide. Uh, I have to leave that, I think. I have my, made my point and also uh, made my point about the relevance of 30 September, the military. Uh, it is inevitable uh, some way. Uh, uh, we have to deal with that. Thank you. And thank you, Pa Hank, for such a thought provoking um, set of comments. And now I will invite uh, Pa Bambang to respond and to engage with some of the ideas that you both um, that you've uh, raised. Okay, thank you very much, Jessica, and also Hanks for a, a very interesting, uh, I think a very interesting presentation on all issue that you bring in. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, to some extent, I, I agree with Hanks. You know, it is it is hardly uh, hardly to find a, a, like a share Indonesian Dutch uh, historiography. Indonesian and Dutch produce a very different narrative in drawing the past experience through the imperial and colonial interaction. It's a very different. But it's a very interesting. Indonesia and Dutch share what tentatively, tentatively I call it colonial logic. So it doesn't mean that I, I agree with, with, with you, Hanks, of, of all your, or your statement, uh, but we share a common ground in understanding the historiography of Indonesia and the, and, and the Netherlands. I mean, that, that's, that's a very important, but, but let, let's, let, let's start with, with something like this, you know, let's start with something like this. You know, Indonesian historiography found the roots of historiography by creating glorious past before the coming of Western influence, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, when the Indonesian archipelago was transformed by East, South and West Asia influences to be what I call it part of the greater Asia identity. This kind of historiography is a challenge toward colonial superiority. So Indonesia, Indonesia I think deliberately chose this. So the call Indonesia was already existing before the Indonesian archipelago was transformed to be a colony. That's, that's, they choose that. You know, that, that, that's, that's why, because of this, then we found the problem there. Western colonialism, in this sense, we are talking Dutch, was denied as a part of Indonesian own history, except except one, what I call it a disruptive nature, from which the Indonesian found the strength to revive their past identity. So the colonial was immediately written off from Indonesian historical frame when the direct interaction ended in 1949. The rest is Indonesian history without colonial past necessary. That's, that's, that I think that's, that's what I, I, I what we, we interesting when we when we when we uh, uh, come to the 1957s, uh, uh, you know, a seminar. You can see that how uh, Indonesian centrism uh, was developed at the time. So, um, to some extent, we already very uh, you know familiar with this. You know how the nation, Indonesian nationalism really inspired, but you know instead. Ironically, what I call it, the coloniality was adapted by Indonesian system as their own. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. You know, the coloniality was able to survive despite the end of coloni colonization. You know, so the coloniality was able to survive despite of the end of colonization. Here, coloniality is like a survival colonialism without necessarily being a colony 
in a new geopolitical entity of independent Indonesia. So uh, we, we can say something like this, coloniality is a product of transformation and rearrangement of colonialism to be an adapted system of independent Indonesia. So what I try to, to understand, uh, the Sukarno uh, always said, revolusi belum selesai, revolusi has not yet ended. Indonesia should be, now I come to myself, I, you know, the last 10 or 15 years, I tried to, to introduce what the concept of what I call, I like to, to distinguish between decolonialization and decolonization. Because of that, in Indonesian historiography, decolonization is a very is a very strange concept. A strange concept in Indonesian. Indonesian did not because that you know uh, hang you you used the, the liberation. You know Indonesia did did not liberate herself from Dutch colonization in political sense, but from Dutch colonialism, yeah in sociological and maybe cultural terms, and, and also might be also, uh, we, we can show in, in the uh, low, something like that. So, um, yeah, beside that, I agree with you, the, the, the independent Indonesia up to now could not be understood without referring to the colonial time. But don't forget, because of that, when I'm, I'm mentioning about the, the uh, you know the the, the, the greater uh, the greater Asia, you know uh, uh, when Indonesia uh, found their uh, 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 way how to uh, 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 conceptualize their their historiography, the greater conception of seven maybe seven to sixteen centuries, I think it it's really created a new consciousness in managing independent Indonesia. You know so. This really, uh, you know, we, we come to uh, to this uh, problem really, and then, uh, like what I say to you uh, at the early. Meanwhile, the Dutch, you know, historiography to to that to that sense, you know, uh, uh, the, the 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 Dutch historiography consistently denied the existence of imperialism and colonialism. That's what we understand. It was the age uh, you may uh, remember when there was a, a group of of uh, 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 Leiden historian uh, uh, coming with the the, the 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 program. First they call it Tanap, and the second they call it Encompass. Uh, and also the, when the commemorating of the 1400 years of, of VOC, you know, it was the age of mutual relation or the age of partnership. So the, the sub superiority, orderliness and modern of Western power was able to civilize, modernize and bring progress to the inferior native of the archipelago. You, 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 can, you can find in the concept of ras in order, peace and, and order, and Pax Nirlandika. You know, it's a very strong uh, concept in the colonial, uh, you know, uh, historiography. So, um, but what I understand, uh, the Dutch historiography is not alone thing. Okay? Because most of history of the period uh, of this period, especially when we are talking about 19, 1945, 1950, uh, 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 in, in your way, uh, you know, uh, written by foreign historian, also took the same view. Uh, I, I give you one example of the of the uh, periodization of, uh, of the very famous book of modern Indonesian history by uh, Mary Lee Crab. You know, uh, the chapter five. Uh, it called the destruction of colonial state. You know, uh, it consists of the Second World War and Japanese occupation, 1942, 1945, and the revolution, 1945, 1950. And then chapter six 
independent Indonesia. That's really the problem because even, even Riklev took the same view. So in Indonesia independent, you know, starting 27 of December, 1949. In fact, I can say, you know, one of, one of, the, cha cha one of, of the part of, of the, in chapter six, uh, democratic experiment, 1950-1957. It is too late because the democratic experiment has already started early when Muhammad Atta issued a decree for the establishment of political parties in 4 November 1945. And when Sultan Shahrir was appointed as prime minister in 14 November 1945. So, so you, you can see now how, but how denying of the, of the fact of Indonesian independence is not only uh, belong to the Dutch historiography, but, but you can see also the, the general, you know, uh, you, you might be remember one of the books by uh, Ong Hokam, Runtuhnya Hindia Belanda. Yeah, nah. so uh, to, for me, your statement about Indonesian history started in 1945, uh, to some extent, uh, you, you, mean, you mentioned that, uh, like a seemingly an, uh, another county. Uh, I, I agree, I agree with your statement to some extent, but not for me, uh, who come from the Bulak Sumo School of History, because uh, we found a very, very, very different way. So when Sartono, uh, uh, I mean, taught us about, uh, you know, uh, this history and then, and then, uh, uh, and then develop again by Kunto Wijoyo, you know, despite of their nationalists, are very nationalist in nature, the existing of colonial time never left behind, including when constructing and explaining history when Indonesia already an independent nation state. You can find in my, 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 last, my latest books on the uh, 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 citizenship, you know, uh, but, but like I said before, I, I agree with you, it could not be generalized, you know, uh, for the whole nature of Indonesian historiography. The conceptual frame of 1957 seminar may be one of the one of the uh, one of the uh, the key thing that we have to think because uh, you know Muhammad Ali and Sujat Moko uh, were in the one side and others in the uh, in another side and Sartono starting to be in the middle. You know something that uh, I think that 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 we we have to to to, to explain it. Um, and finally, I would like to say, because uh, about the, most of your, your, your statement on the military, I, I, most of them I agree, but one, one point I would like to mention here. The revolution was the period of military formation as a distinctive agency from others in independent Indonesia. Definitely it inspired by military role during the Japanese period. It found a fertile ground when the Dutch was attempting to rebuild colonial power in the former colony. Because Indonesia, you know, there, there was like a, a, a different opinion on this. You know, uh, when the col Dutch colonial, uh, 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 you know, regime ended, uh, you know that myself, in one side, I I, I always said the in Dutch colonial, uh, 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 um, you know, government ended in 1942, you know, um, and 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 rest, and then it replaced by 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 the by the, the Japanese. Um, you can see, you know, uh, the early history of BKR, one of the examples for that, so a very deep in reality, when civilian government really controlled the military. But it changed very quickly when Nika and then uh, KNIL, you know, uh, uh, who were uh, hiding behind 
uh, like we, we call it Mambuancheng, hiding behind the back of the British troops, you know, considered as military threat to the newly independent Republic. I'm really sure it is not about the former Dutch or Japanese military. I, I give you the example for this is the guerrilla strategy from the Nasution. You know, Nasution, we know all about him. He was not from the Japanese time, but he was come from the, the Dutch colonial time. So this kind of thing, I think, we have to, to rethink about the, the, the way how to, to understand the role of, of, of a military uh, in, yeah, you, you, I, I use your, your word, you know, haunting uh, Indonesian historiography. I think we have to distinguish it uh, between what happened military as a whole and then uh, uh, the, the period of the Suharto times. That's that I think my, 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 uh, my uh, comment on, on your very excellent uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you uh, so much, Pa Bambang, for, for that, uh, those insightful discussant uh, comments. Um, so now we have about 20 minutes to have a conversation about what um, has been uh, the conversation thus far. And we've had uh, quite a few uh, very uh, good and insightful comments. And so what uh, Professor Pahank has, has asked is that uh, you be allowed to uh, speak and elaborate somewhat briefly on the comments that you've uh, submitted. And so I will be inviting, um, enabling uh, those those people to uh, turn on, like to to speak. And so um, the first person that gave, um, I think, a very uh, interesting comment about the sources of uh, some of these absences that we see is uh, Hans uh, Pohl. So Pohl, I'm sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing uh, your name. So I'm gonna be. Um, hoping to try to <laughs> allow you to speak, if that's okay, and you can elaborate on your point that you put it in the Q&A. If you can unmute. Yeah, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, well, first I want to reflect on uh, my own childhood in the Netherlands. Um, I grew up in Assen, very large Moluccan population. And of course, in high school, uh, the, uh, the advice about the future education was, oh, you should go to technical school. You should go to what is called household school, so the, 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 to become a good uh, householder. There was absolutely no encouragement of migrants, as far as I could see as a kid, from the Indonesia to the Netherlands to pursue anything academic. When I went to university in the Netherlands, well, Academics in the Netherlands, especially with them, but still very much there is Lily White. Gloria Vector wrote this great book, White Innocence. And you know, she might have gone over the top a little, but it is a real, it is still consistently a real problem in the Netherlands. And this means that alternate voices are not quite uh, uh, present or having the academic credentials to speak their voice. Now, sadly, we had the uh, exposition about the Dutch participation in the slave trade this year. So many Dutch people said, really? That comes as a real surprise. There was a widespread opposition that this could not be. Any critique of the Dutch violence in the Indonesian War of Independence is invariably met by anger, like, why are you even talking about it? So uh, the, the atmosphere in the Netherlands is not really conducive to this kind of thing, sadly. Now, I do agree with Hank that one of the things that's missing in the work historians do on Dutch in Indonesia is the connection between colonial and post-colonial times. I highlighted this myself for physicians in my own book, Nurturing Indonesia, that the traditions going from the colonial times, post-colonial times, are far more characterized by continuities than discontinuities. And I hope that uh, that kind of work um, will be conducted much more. I think, uh, yeah. I think indeed because of the partition of historical work between 
colonial versus post-colonial, we missed the most important point. Thank you so much for for those points. It's uh, as a as a transplant, a recent transplant to the to the Netherlands um, academia. It's it's been really interesting. Um, Hank or or uh, Bambang, do you have anything to say in response? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um... Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Hans, uh, of course, that <clears throat> there was no encouragement whatsoever uh, for the migrants to um, become, say, full-fledged Dutch, Dutch citizens at the beginning. Um, Moroccan soldiers and their families were put away in, in former German prison camps, which is, um, well, it is one of the, the, the disgraces in, in, in Dutch history. Um, we, we, we had to wait for, say, the third generation of these migrants who finally or managed to go to university. And then a whole, today, a whole new debate is, is emerging. Um, so it, there was an enormous time left, apparently, of, of say, of almost 70 years. 70 years before these discussions finally evolved. And it is no coincidence indeed that uh, it was only this year that the National Museum in Amsterdam uh, organized uh, an exhibition of colonial slavery. And <clears throat> it is also no uh, exception of no coincidence that early uh, 2020, the same Rijksmuseum uh, will uh, open uh, an exhibition on the Indonesian Revolution. So <clears throat> that the, these are, in say, in official Dutch historiography, iconic events because the National Muse Museum is the icon of of uh, of, of uh, 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 Dutch history. So it allowed uh, slavery uh, and the revolution to be part of that uh, uh, canon. Um, to comment briefly on two, two remarks by, by uh, the very wise comments made, made by uh, Pabamba. I should, of course, deeply apologize to uh, gloss over so rudely over the contribution of um, <clears throat> Dogja historians, Pasartono, uh, etc. <clears throat> but um, they were important in, in the 1980s. But what is striking that um, Dogja, um, never fully succeeded in dominating national historiography. And it still has uh, the military uh, to, to convince yeah. that there are other and more multiple views on, on historiography. But you're, you're absolutely right about what you said about uh, the contribution of, of um, say, the Bulak Sumer School of History. Um, now, I, I, I found your uh, statement about colonialism was adapted as their own by, uh, say, the Indonesian state. That is, that's perhaps basically what I intended to say. Um, despite the fact that, in the in the in the general view, there is an Indonesia, and then it is dis disrupted by by colonialism and after li li uh, liberation. Uh, it takes on its own life as if as if as if colonialism never really existed and never really impacted on Indonesia. But yes, that that is an uh, that is an important point. And here I find we uh, a, a strong common ground of agreement of of this of this uh, theme. So I leave it. Thank you. Um... So we have an, another uh, comment from uh, Robert Cribb. Uh, I'm going to allow you to talk. So if you could, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you would be willing to. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Hank. Thanks very much, Bang Bang. Uh, two great talks. Uh, but it did strike me that you talked as if the only people who are doing research on Indonesian history are Indonesians and Dutch, whereas it it seems to me that one of the unusual features of Indonesian history, unlike Australian history or Dutch history for that matter, 
is that there are so many outsiders, Japanese, Australians, Americans, uh, some British, some Germans, <clears throat> who are doing really serious work on Indonesian history and contributing to the construction of the, the story of Indonesia. Uh, your description of Indonesian historiography was focused very much on the colonial, post-colonial tension. And I wonder how you would see the role of outsiders in addressing those issues. Thank you. Pa Bambang or Pa Hing? Uh, yes, I, I, I mentioned to, to I mean, earlier that um, uh, others, uh, historian from the other sides of, of the world also, uh, uh, um, you know, wrote exactly take the most of them take the same view with with the Dutch uh, 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 historiography. I give you the example like the, that's one of the very famous books of Amara uh, Ritlev. So uh, denying of the, the existence of Indonesian independence, that's the really a problems. You know, uh, that's that's you know, it is it's really not clear because what I understand, what I understand. To some extent, Indonesia was struggling, you know, struggling to defend their independence. But at the same time, they do their daily uh, uh, political uh, works. We, we can say something like that. Although it's not really, uh, you know, a, a full function, but it was there. So something that this why the existing of Indonesian independence. Uh, 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 in 1940, between 1945 and 1949, I think that's, that's the key point. You know, you have to really, you have really to change the, the situation. It's not only about war, something like that. And because the revolution to some extent, that's why, and then I introduced the, the term of decolonialization. It should be, uh, uh, distinguished from the decolonization. So, because Indonesia was no longer the colony of the Netherlands, you know, when it declared independence. That, that's something I think that's, that's really the problem. That's, that's the main point. That's my, 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 uh, my comment to Robert. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Yeah, Robert. Uh Thank you for your remark. Of course, you're right. Um, I, I didn't want to, to suggest uh, in any sense that um, authors outside the Netherlands or uh, Indonesia are uh, irrelevant. They were extremely relevant uh, it, among historians. <clears throat> but what strikes me actually is that none of the major books, say by Cahin, by Anderson, were translated in Dutch. It never reached a larger, larger uh, audience. Uh, so it's, of course, it, it, it influenced to an enormous degree uh, the thinking and, and courses of, of uh, research of, of Dutch uh, historians. But that's, and I, I fully admit it, I grew up basically with those books and then started to, after that, to read these boring uh, Dutch uh, books on uh, 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 colonial diplomacy. Um, but that is a bit outside the scope of my my talk, where I would like to I wanted to to confront Indonesian and and Dutch uh, uh, approaches, and indeed uh, Australian, American, and other uh, Japanese approach did not really fit in. That was much more a sort of international uh, discourse, in which apparently mainstream Dutch historiography. But also Indonesian historiography, except for the school of uh, Sartonga Katudiyo, hardly hardly participated. So it was a separate separate uh, uh, thing. So uh, sorry if I uh, made the impression that I uh, deliberately ignored uh, uh, the work by Australian and uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, other Anglo-Saxon historians. Okay, um, so we it's, we have five minutes left. So we have, even though we have so many uh, great comments, I would like to invite a final question from um, Jazak Hidayat. So I'll be enabling you to speak now. 
Uh, Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my question is. Can you hear me? Um. Okay, it, it, it's a bit noisy here. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Okay, uh, I'm going to my point that uh, I did my PSDP a years ago in Sweden, and I found it's hard to find any materials on portfolio studies for television. But uh, this is not the case when I went to uh, uh, like Indian history or African history, that's very rich with fossil uh, studies. So my question is, what is actually prevent many Indonesian experts or Indonesians from expanding or deepening their uh, concern about Indonesian fossil studies? So at least I, I, I didn't find any any uh, source of or even from, from Indonesian uh, uh, studies that uh, formally stated that the study about post-colonial Indonesia uh, is just about uh, Indonesian history, but not uh, studies that inspired by uh, post-colonial uh, conception. So uh, that's my question. What is actually the event many Indonesian uh, from the response? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in case um, that was missed, uh, what is uh, per perhaps um, preventing it, many uh, Indonesianists or experts on Indonesian studies from exp expanding and deepening um, exploration on Indonesian colonialism, perhaps um, the scholarship universities in Indonesia, maybe Pabambang has some thoughts. I'm really sorry, Jessica, I could not hear. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. What, 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 what he said? Yeah. Essentially, his um, he was saying that uh, he found very rich materials on postcolonialism from Indian and African experts. So uh, perhaps, what are some structural obstacles in Indonesian um, academia? What is perhaps preventing um, the absence of postcolonial studies? Like, are there any structural? Okay. okay. No, no. Yeah. I get your point. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, it it it, it is right uh, because it's a very easy to get the 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 the, the document from the colonial uh, from uh, from the colonial past, you know, or the dance. But now, you know, especially for the nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, then some already in nineteen sixties, where it's also available now, you know, in in the national archives, you know, uh, 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 and also uh, we can find it a lot in the newspapers as well. So now it's getting better, you know. It's 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 getting better compared to the when I was uh, doing my my PhD when when more than twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that's a nearly nearly thirty years ago. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 better now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To some extent, he's right. Yeah, that's great. Um. So it sounds that there is a lot of availability of archives now. We just have to to embrace that. Um, so we're just at um, we're just out of time. Um, so I would like to really thank the audience, but also Pa Hank and Pa Bambang uh, for this really amazing discussion. Uh, please join us for the next session of IS4, uh, and that's on October twenty eighth where we'll be hosting Professor Merlina Lim and Irene Putrancho on the topic of social media, politics, and algorithms in Indonesia. And this that will also be a very exciting talk as well. So thank you uh, very much. And I will hope to see all of you uh, next month.